Well, welcome to the Apologetics.com radio show. My name is Carrie Edwards. I am the host for this evening. Uh, good evening, by the way, gentlemen. I've got Lenny Esposito and Jacob here in the studio with me. How are you doing, gentlemen? Good. Good, good. All right. Um, any news? Uh, what's going on with your various ministries? I know, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Jacob. There's, uh, You've got a conference lined up uh, June 11th, Correct. right? T- yeah. Tell us more about that. Yeah, uh, so the conference is being organized by a ministry called Reasonable Truth. Um, so uh, the topic of the conference is human dignity and the role of government. Two important topics. They're trying to kind of find an intersection of both. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the good thing is that uh, it's free. I love that. Anyone That's the best to attend. news. Yes. And it is being, uh, um, it will be held at Biola University at the Myers Hall. Uh, so 11th of June. Uh, if anyone is interested, you're welcome to register online uh, on reasonabletruth.org. And it will take you to the page where you could actually register. So we have uh, lined up like Kevin Lewis, uh, who is a professor at Biola University, who's the main plenary speaker. And then we have Prashant Daniel uh, and Carlos Pamplona. They both actually founded this organization and um, yours truly. Yeah. I think really I heard somebody did that. a dissertation on human dignity, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, so my dissertation is on human dignity, and I was looking at it from most, mostly from an Eastern perspective as to how people understand it and situate it. So, that yeah. should be fun. All right, good. How about you, Lenny? What's up with uh, oh, Come Reason Ministry? Well, we've been doing lots of things. Just uh, got back from uh, <clears throat> teaching at a homeschool convention with the California Home Educators Association. So that was that was nice. Been doing a big kind of Instagram push to try and reach out and uh, getting a lot of good traffic there. So uh, if you're not if you are on Instagram, you can come follow Come Reason there. And then may have an opportunity to actually go travel to South Africa this summer and uh, with a Ratio Christi chapter down that way that's doing a a whole conference and symposium. So I'm still trying to see if we can work out the details on that, but that's a possibility that should be very exciting as well. Yeah, Harry, I should say, uh, Dr. Edwards, before you continue, you're the one who's always hosting the show. So let me ask you, how are you doing and how is your ministry coming along? Uh, Yeah, well, thanks for asking, Jacob. So um, many of you know, I answered the call to be an associate pastor at La Habra Christian Church. It's part time. So if you're looking for a home church, I would encourage you guys to check it out, La Habra Christian Church. I think we have a uh, dynamic lead pastor there who literally speaks to the times. Um, His name is uh, Pastor Jason, Pastor Jason Kim. So if you're there, uh, PJ, uh, we're just saying hi. Shout out to PJ. I I like that he's an avid YouTuber. Hmm. So Ah. check, yeah. And not only that, for fun, he likes to do evangelism. He calls it uber evangelism so he drives his car he he takes uh passengers uh, uh he's an uber driver uh when he likes to do evangelistic uh events and the deal he has with the passengers is he will ask them uh that he would pay for their ride if they're willing to listen to the gospel presentation mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's cool and he, he records the conversations and it's on youtube and uh, recently yeah. we went with him to ucla yes no yeah. i want to report uh, about that because jacob you were with us yeah. and uh he again he's big our, our pastor's big on youtube so he literally has a professional uh editor and the clips look pretty amazing yeah and uh, I think he's going to uh, uh, produce or, or generate those clips maybe on a drip system, meaning not all at once. And I think the previews are mm-hmm. out. I don't know if the first episode is out there. But we spent over three hours there at UCLA. Yeah. And Jacob and I had a blast talking with the UCLA students. And if you're a, a fan of UCLA, um, kudos to you guys. We had a wonderful time there. All of them were respectful, except for that one group <laughs> that we we got ambushed. Again, you know, we we're expecting that already. But uh, all of the serious ones that we talked to were super respectful. And I want to say half of them already knew the Lord, about half of them. 
And then half of the other half uh, either were involved in, in some kind of cult. Uh, and then the other half of the, which, which is a fourth of them, then um, they, they didn't have a worldview. Like it's, it's whatever makes you feel good. That, that's, mm. that was kind of like their worldview. And, uh, and they would hope that they'd go to heaven because of their good works. Good works. Yeah. So that was interesting, right? What, what did you think about that experience? I was also impressed at the same time with some faithful Christians who were making their presence known yes. uh, by standing strong for what they believe in. Yeah. So I loved interacting with them and for, for them to see us there on the campus and doing what we were doing yeah. to share the gospel. Uh, I think they were really encouraged. They were, yeah. They uh, approached us. They because we had a table there, you know, mm -hmm. with apologetics dot com, uh, you know, sign. Uh, we did have a few crazy ones, but uh, they were just toying with us. They were. Malicious. They gave us the opportunity to actually present the gospel even better. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But yeah, th there is that one group. You, you'll see it in the previews. In fact, it's in the previews. Yeah. Uh, this one group, they pretty much ambushed us and they were promoting porn. I know it's terrible, but they were really getting in our faces too. But anyways, uh, and, and the sad thing about that, the, the person we were talking to thought that we were uh, the, pranking them. They thought that they were part of our prank. So that, huh. was, that was kind of mm -hmm. sad, you yeah. know. So anyways. Um, Interesting, uh, given tonight's topic, that the people who were trying to chip in were promoting porn. <laughs> yeah, because, we'll talk about that. Sexual, Specifically in metaverse. Yeah, <laughs> sexual uh, drive yeah. Or, or the centrality of, of the sexual desire right. to the human Well, we'll talk condition. about that. It, it's not so much that porn is a new thing. It's no. it's it's the, what's shocking nowadays. It's it become normalized. It's, it's normative. It's socially acceptable. And if I'm not wrong, actually, they were talking about this was their project. Yeah. 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 They were proud project of it. Project in meta, Metaverse. Right. That's yeah. the difference. That's, it's, that's, it's, it's, not, it's not cloak and dagger stuff anymore. Yeah. It's not back rooms and shady deals. It's, well, it, you, you can see... Um, sitcoms now where the, the star, the hero, the, the, the main character, the likable guy, they're the ones that are watching porn. Yeah, yeah. yeah that never used to be the case. Mm. So we'll talk about that. In fact, uh, let, let's get into the, the meat and um, really why we're, we're here. What's, what's the main thing we're going to be talking about? So if you've been following our radio programs, we've been tackling books. Uh, we just finished Paul Gold's book, um, cultural apologetics a couple months ago. Now we're on to another book, and that book is The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. And I know uh, you guys have been jazzed about this, been excited about this for a while. You've been asking me, hey, let's do this one. So finally we're doing it, gentlemen. Uh, and so this is good stuff. And um, I, I, here, here's my uh, take on the book so far. Carl, Carl Truman is attempting to explain modernity to the church. And he does this by synthesizing the ideas slash writings of Philip Reif. He's an American sociologist. Charles Taylor, a Canadian uh, philosopher. And Alistair McIntyre, uh, a famous name in moral philosophy. In fact, uh, the last two I mentioned, they're, they're still alive and doing great work. So this book tries to uncover the underlying basis for today's sexual revolution. So like I was mentioning before, it's not like uh, infidelity or pornography or, you know, illicit sex are new. It's not, it's not that. We've had that for uh, since the dawn of man, right? But what's different now is the, the shame is gone. And not only that, it's actually... Um, promoted now. It's become sort of a virtue. It's become part of life. And, and so the author is asking, what makes those kinds of things acceptable and others not? Like, for instance, he points out that, well, not all, all sexual perversion is accepted today. So pornography sort of is on the up and up, meaning it's, it's normal, it's actually popular, but, but not pedophilia. 
Not yet. Uh, not yeah. yet. No, that's true. Not yet. We're going to be covering a lot of ideas, and uh, we're still going to be, and this is just chapter one, but we'd like to encourage you to pick up the book and read something that might be a stretch for some. It'll help you understand today's, like I said, today's sexual revolution project behind um, transgenderism, all, all sorts of sexual activity that is strange to us today. So anyways, I want to ask you guys, what are some of your thoughts of the book? What, Why would you recommend this book? This is what I would say that I think we're called to be like the sons of Esekar, understanding the times mm. in which we live. And I think this book gives us a good um, a way of understanding where we are as a culture. It may not advocate anything in particular as to how to deal with where we are, but it does provide us, uh, uh, gives us a trajectory in history as to how did we arrive at where we are. And I personally, to me, I think it, uh, the ideas were not uh, precisely new. Um, uh, however, what happened was actually it gave, a, gave me a good structure yeah, a good framework to think about those ideas and those authors that you mentioned and to make sense of uh, the challenges that we are facing. Uh, and not just that as to what brings them all together. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Yeah. And I haven't read the entire book at this point, but I, I want to mention that a lot of the philosophers that Truman, Carl Truman, the author of this book, is putting together, they are sort of, within the Enlightenment period. So that is, to me, significant. That's good, because now you can trace their ideas, the genealogy of ideas, within a confined period. You don't have to go all the way back to the Greek philosophers. You don't have to go to today's philosophers. You can just stick with, um, you know, the Enlightenment thinkers. So some, some of the philosophers that he mentions a lot are Rousseau, Hegel, Freud, Marx, Nietzsche, Marcuse, uh, Descartes, obviously. Um, so again, they're Enlightenment thinkers of the 18th century, and so that, that should be helpful. It, it'd be a clue as well as to what happened during the Enlightenment. If you are interested, uh, just trying to figure out where ideas come from, I think that's a good start, actually, the and, Enlightenment period. And anyone who picks up this book, uh, I would recommend them to stay with it. It might be initially a little uh, heady uh, if you don't have a background in philosophy and uh, or uh, um, philosophical thoughts and uh, sociological thoughts. So I would say stay with it, you know, and it will make sense. And at the end, you will yeah. you will thank the author yeah. for, for the beautiful work he's done. Yeah, I think I think the book does two things well. One is to synthesize the the three main projects of uh, Rife, Taylor, and, and McIntyre into a single entity so you don't have to, because let's face it, you know, Charles Taylor's A Secular Age, that, that, that's an 800-page tome by itself. Yeah. Just to get through that is, is a lot of work. And uh, so this will give you kind of a, a, an e easier in to understanding the primary points on each of those three individuals and how they reinforce one another or how we can understand modern society through those three lenses. I think that does a, it does a good job there. The other thing I think it does well, especially by pointing out from the introduction, is just how far we've shifted from what was understood before. Because, you know, it, the old saying, a fish doesn't know that it's wet, right, is, is true in our society. And we just don't realize how bizarre what we hold today is, when comparing it to most of human history, so uh, we're, we're going to talk about Philip Reif and the, and the four different stages of um, how mankind understands himself, but one of the, you know, he, he talks about the political man, the, the religious man, the economic man, and then the psychological man. All through history, there's always been something that's defined who we are, but that something that's defined who we are has always been an external referent mm. until now. Yeah. And now something drastically changed, and our reference of understanding who we are and our, how our society works is now from the inside out. Right, right. That's never been around before. Right, right. And so that's a big deal. And I think, I think he does a, a pretty good job initially 
saying you have to start thinking more broadly in right, those right. regards. And in fact, there are some things that certain philosophers who, in my own understanding initially, uh, did not advocate for certain things, but digging a little bit deeper, you realize that they were saying something very unhelpful to human flourishing. Yeah. Um, so we'll cover some of those things. Let uh, me just add something to it. Um, usually we think that ideas do trickle down from the West to the rest of the world. But we have to understand that uh, rest of the world, most of the world, uh, Eastern world is collectivistic and it's very traditional in nature. At the same time, why is it that they do not hesitate to accept ideas uh, that trickle down from the West? Because I think West is looking more Eastern now. Hmm. in many regards. Uh, and I would say if one reads this book and reads Eastern philosophy, you can clearly see how much we have adopted the Eastern idea, pantheistic idea. I was telling you, Harry, a while ago, the very term, the Sanskrit word of aham brahmasmi, I am the Brahma. Mm -hmm. That's what this is ultimately. ultimately. I am God. Yeah. So I am the ultimate reality. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think... Uh, one will get that perspective, a clear perspective of uh, how that's informing our culture today from this book. Isn't yeah. that the original sin, though? Isn't that what, what Satan tempted Adam and Eve? You know, yeah. you will become like God, God, knowing, no, you will know right from wrong, good from evil, because you've experienced it, and you're yeah. sitting on, you know, yeah. you had an experience, but it's not the same as becoming God, it's, yeah. but the idea that you want to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not enough that you were created in his image yeah you just don't want anybody higher than you right that's the issue and that's the same thing with lucifer right mm -hmm. like, it's it's a shift from being image bearers to image makers yeah the whole idea of uh i, I think we'll talk about that even like the role of institution in in forming individuals right. and then we have turned it into a place of performance rather. yes right i like that what he uh does on that um our formation depends upon our performance yeah. Yeah. now. now. Uh, before we get any further, uh, I do appreciate Rod Dreher here in, in the forward. I think the forward alone is pro probably worth the price of the book, all right? Um, but see, we as apologists, right? I mean, our ministry is apologetics.com. So one would think that the way that, that we fix today's uh, issues, to cultural issues, is maybe more doctrine or uh, a better explanation of the Kalam cosmological argument or, you know, all of these kinds of uh, ways that we defend the gospel. But I, I think we've come to a point in our culture where a lot of these categories uh, that, that are in our minds, you know, the cognitive uh, categories, rationality, they no longer work or it doesn't work as well as it used to. And so Rod Dreher points this out, I think, very well. So I want to I, I just read um, what he said here. He says, unfortunately, the gaze of most Christians cannot seem to penetrate the surface of postmodernity. All right, that statement alone, I mean, We've we've done this long enough to know that there, there was a lot of confusion 20 years ago about even post-modernity, right? What is that, right? All we know is that it's after modernity. But e even during that time, it was kind of weird. But anyways, he continues, many regard the collapse moralistically as if the tide could be turned back with a robust reassertion of Christian doctrine and ethical rigor. See, unfortunately... Uh, you know, I am sad that, um, and this is my commentary, a lot of apologetics project is really focused on just tightening up our arguments, making sure you've got the, the best evidences out there, and then cultural, culture will, will turn to Christ and things will get better. Well, we've been doing this for more than two decades, and uh, culture has just gotten worse. And we've, just think about it, uh, you know, and, and again, this is not... A dis disparaging thing. I, uh, hopefully, it's a uh, it's an encouraging thing, because we know what the uh, the work entails now. This, this the scope and breadth of the work that we must do. But um, we've gotten more apologetics programs. There's many now. We've 
become sort of salt and light, you know, doing doing this. We're, we're spread around. Uh, there's many of us, kind of like the uh, Jay Warner Wallace's one dollar apologist. There's m- more and more of us, and yet I am sad that culture is not getting any better. There must be another way. So again, continuing Rod Dreher's thing, he goes, and I think he means this well, right? Um, don't don't take it bad when he says three three cheers for robust reassertions of doctrinal orthodoxy and ethical rigor, and this is where. This is, he's right on. But it's not enough. Ordinary Christians need desperately, need a more profound and and holistic grasp of the modern and postmodern condition. It is the water in which we swim, the air that we breathe. All right, I'm going to stop there. What, What he's saying is we need to understand, like you were saying, Lenny, that we're swimming in this water and we don't know it we don't recognize it we we don't feel it so what are what is the water we teach it to our children right even though we're trying to be something different than the world yeah that's true because there's that tacit acceptance of these kinds of things it's uh, that that's what culture does to us um whether we are aware of it or not um and so it 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 needs and and I'm not suggesting that we need to think harder because remember like i said it's the categories of thinking no longer apply today i'm not again hear me out i've never uh, jettisoned rationality because that that's impossible right, right. but there's got to be another way to uh, approach this issue um and i shared i know i shared with you guys how nowadays and this is harry edwards confession time, I have stayed away from the term worldview. I'm not rejecting it. I understand it. I appreciate it. But I don't even use that nowadays, you know, to to, to help uh, with conversations with other people. I just use a term like social imaginary or uh, terms that are more uh, enmeshed in culture, things that uh, just establishing common ground. We've talked about that before. Uh, so I know we're coming up on a break soon, but um, all right, we got two and a half minutes more. But uh, what are g- give me some first impressions of the book? Uh, things that you're excited about, things that you're looking forward to in terms of uh, what we're going to be covering in this show in the in the next few months. Well, like I said, um, one of the things that I thought was really helpful was the the intro when uh, Truman compared his grandfather to say his son. And he says, these people live in different worlds with different points of reference about what's valuable and what's not. So he argues that, you know, if I were to ask my grandfather, who was a a blue collar worker most of his life, and my grandfather was as well, uh, are you fulfilled in your job? And I would ask my son that same question. You would get two different responses. Today, the kids will say, well, you know, I'd really like to be more creative. I'd like to have something that, that makes me feel more successful, more uh, uh, accomplished, or, or more I, I can produce this and that. Uh, but if you ask my grandfather that, he would say, what do you mean? You know, I, I go to work. And it gives me a paycheck so I can buy this nice house. I have a car. I can feed my family. I don't have to worry about them going hungry. You've got new clothes on your back, don't you? You know, you, you, you have enough to go to school. Um, what, what's there to, what more is there to be fulfilled about? It does what a job is supposed to do, and that's provide for us. It's not supposed to be self-fulfilling. It, it made no sense. And then he turns and he says, this is why... If I were to say to my grandfather the statement, you know, I am a man trapped in a woman's body, or if some, he were to read that in a paper, that would be equally confusing to him. He would say, I have no understand. What, do you, what does that even mean? Those are just words. Whereas today, it's completely different. You don't, and you had made the point, you don't have to be a student of, you know, the queer theory in order to hear those words and know what they mean. Every junior high kid understands that. Why is that accepted now when it would have been foreign language to most any human being through the past millennia? Yeah. And so what is the difference? Where did this 
where did this human project change? And this has been really the center of some of my uh, investigation and study is like, how did we get from there to here? Yeah, that's always important because if we know a little bit about uh, the underlying causes, and then maybe we can address those symptoms better. Right. Um, but we can't just be reactive, you see, and we can't just be throwing more doctrine out there uh, when the world in which we live uh, operate in a different kind of a, you know, social you're, imaginary. You're not scratching the right itch. That's yeah. right. There you go. Well, I think we are uh, almost out of time for this first half hour. You've been listening to Apologetics.com, where we um, challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. We have been talking about Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And we will continue our discussion after a few messages. Welcome back to the Apologetics.com radio show. My name is Harry Edwards, and I'm back in the studio with my good friends Jacob and Lenny. How are you doing, gentlemen? Good. Good. Good, good. Well, the first hour, we uh, were talking about Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and we're going to continue our discussion. We're really covering uh, Chapter 1. And uh, again, we would encourage you to pick up the book and follow along with us. I have, for, for the past few years, stayed away from using the term worldview. Like, I, I, I know what it is, and uh, it's still a helpful term. But if I, if I make that the basis of, let's say, my presentation, I think my audience for today, I'm convinced they won't really care for the most part. And um, the reason why that is is because the categories that worldview uses really are based on, let, let's say, uh, th your ability to know anything. Uh, it, it's, it's coming, it's approaching knowledge from the cognitive faculties, right? When in today's culture, they even doubt that there is such a thing as objective truth. And so in, instead of spending a lot of time to me building or helping them construct a worldview, um, I'd rather just meet them where they are. And so a helpful tool that I've uh, been using is the, the whole idea of the social imaginary. And that's really popularized by Charles Taylor. And I would encourage you to also pick up that book if, if you can. I know, like you were saying, Lenny, it's a big, fat tome. Yeah. But it really is good. If you're interested Use in these kinds of things. when you pick it up, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, so uh, this is Philip, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is Carl Truman's summary of uh, the social imaginary. He says, in sum, the social imaginary is the way people think about the world, how they imagine it to be, how they act intuitively in relation to it, though that is emphatically not to make the social imaginary simply into a set of identifiable ideas. It is the totality of the way we look at our world to make sense of it and to make sense of our behavior within it. So as I read that definition, uh, what do you guys think is the main difference between, let's say, that and a worldview? Because it is similar. It sounds similar, doesn't it? Yeah, a worldview normally answers questions like uh, the meaning of life, meaning of existence, uh, understanding of who God is, things like that. Social imaginary uh, right now is what ideas are popular in culture. So he says, you know, the social imaginary is that common understanding. So it's a shared mm, right. uh, point of view that which makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. Uh, so it, it gives legitimacy in a social context. Uh, it, it makes whether right or wrong, it's just we're we're walking the same path because you agree with me and I agree with you, and that's the the social. So it's that's the social part of the social imaginary. How we both imagine we'd either like the world to be. So it's a, it isn't a truth claim per mm -hmm. se. Right. It's it's a claim as to how we want to live right. versus, or it's the way that the world is perceived by the person as it is, whether wrong or rightly. So, uh, yeah, right. and also in one sense, I, I, the way I understand it is that it's it's how 
uh, authentic worldview of an individual gets translated or actualized yeah. in That's imagery, right, right. in stories. Normative. In, in, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, uh, even in behavior, public yes. behavior. Mostly, actually, in behavior, yeah. too. Yeah. Right. So, in, in a way, is that, that, that's actually very helpful because if we're going to be talking in, in evangelizing or doing apologetics with uh, a seeker, then we're able to draw out those things already, like what, what they believe in. So, we, we put that in, in their social imaginary structure rather than a worldview structure, you know, and, and they can embrace it because we're not, we're not debating truth with them at that yeah, point. Yeah, so, so, so worldview is, is almost unstated assumptions or biases that you just hold that you've maybe not even thought through. Right. You just don't, you don't, you don't necessarily bring them to the fore. But social imaginary, those concepts you do know you know, it's um, like you own it. So, that, so yeah. yeah. So there's a you know, it's it's wrong to discriminate against someone because of their gender or because of their gender preference. Those those kinds of things you can voice in. So it, that's different than right. than an assumption that says um, we're all materialists right, or right. something uh, like that. Right. So and, it's 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 even more surfacey. Yeah. Which is helpful today. Right. 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 I'll add this that I think social imaginary would be it has more hold on one's emotions and feeling, mm -hmm. whereas worldview would have hold on one's will. Sure. Uh, that could be one of the distinctions to be. And usually in the kind of culture in which we live, um, feelings and emotions trump our will. Right. And we today, go after yeah. It. yeah. Right. So again, that's a helpful category um, made popular by Charles Taylor. Um, let's move to, uh, in the beginning of the chapter, uh, Truman talks about uh, Rafe's, uh, right, is it Rafe or Rife? Rife, Rife yeah. Uh, Rife's categories of sort of human development in terms of... Uh, the nature uh, the, of the, cultures. The, yeah, the nature of cultures. Yeah. And so he starts out with uh, the political man moves over to, and then it moves to the uh, religious man and then to the economic man. And then we're finally in this stage right now, currently in the uh, psychological man. So I remember when we were talking, the book does not provide the bridge from, from the man to man, you know, yeah. the different stages. Uh, and, and, to be fair, maybe they're not stages, but um, but it would be nice because they are located in history. Yeah, it's an evolution, and this is the yeah. Western culture primarily right, that right. he's talking about. So, so, and if you understand the history of Western culture, the polis, the city, grows up out of the family, right? So you have a family and and descendants from that family, and when you get enough people. Uh, they say, well, we don't want anyone else coming in and stealing our sheep or, or pillaging our town or things like that, so we need to build a wall. And you start to get um, critical mass, and so you have to start having rules and regulations. And right. what happens is if you are part of the family, if you're part of the polis, that mm -hmm. city, um, then you work towards it. So in the Roman area, you were a Roman or you were something else, or you were a Greek or you were the barbarians, right? You were the Romans, you were the Vandals, yeah. um, you, you were the Japanese, you were the Gaijin. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's us and them, Jew, right. Gentile, that, that right. whole, that, and you are for us or you're not. And this is what got the Christians into trouble right, right. because you don't worship the emperor. I don't care what else you worship. You can worship Jesus all you want, but you got to worship the emperor because that means that you're part of Rome mm -hmm. and you're for Rome. And the polis was just the natural outgrowth of being part of the family, being protective. You do what's best for the city because what's best for the city means we all thrive better. Mm -hmm. And that happened until the rise of the church. Christianity, mm -hmm. like I said, breaks that mold. It says, no, 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 no. It's not the, what's best for the city because there's other cities and we are to love our enemies as much as we love ourselves. And when the church comes up and starts teaching a different ethical framework, then the church becomes the authority mm -hmm. as opposed to the king or as opposed to the emperor. And it then becomes dominant in man's daily life. So we move into the medieval mm -hmm. period. Yeah. That becomes... The religious man. This is this is where you get your primary understanding of where right and wrong come from. We follow the church's dictums, the church's morals, and everything revolves around the local assembly and the local church. It, it is the priest who is the one that you seek 
out in order to provide counsel and understanding. And really, at that point in history, they are also the scholars of the world. Until the Enlightenment, when man says, well, we can reason without God, right? And we, we talked a little bit about this. The Protestant Reformation actually unwittingly helps this along by saying, well, we don't need a central authority figure. We can each interpret scriptural mandates for ourselves. Now, they try to make that in a state church, but they find that it fractures and becomes subdivided and things like that. At the same time, the the ultimate outworking of this is the rise of, a, of the United States and how individualistically you can succeed. So how do we measure who knows what is better? Well, we look at how they succeed. We look at the Rockefellers. We look at the J. Paul Gettys. We look at, right, the... the Hey, they seem to be, this is the only way we can have any kind of status measurement mm-hmm. because there's no other, there's no barons and yeah. things like that. The only thing we can measure is who's doing better. So economics becomes the driver and you're identified by what you do. Mm-hmm. Are you a blue collar man? Are you a, an executive, right? And this, again, this extends all the way through to the early 20th century. This really is the way most of America has seen itself, and most of Western Europe followed after, but through, through that idea, until the 20th century. And then Freud comes along and says, you're all sexually repressed anyway, right? <laughs> uh, and you really need to dig into yourselves in order to find out who you are. Yeah. And that gets cultivated popularly because there are people who say, well, I can never be a, a J. Paul Getty, but look at, wasn't he really not a nice guy mm-hmm, or, mm-hmm. you know, look at the robber barons and the, so, so really it's what you believe about yourself that matters. And again, this comes to fruition. You see the Benjamin Spocks of the world starting to write about how your kids' feelings matter more right. and you don't uh, have to take care of them and things like that. You, you know, the, your children aren't necessarily to conform to culture. It's we got to think about the kids and make sure they're happy. And th- that's a big shift. And And so now, we have a, a generation of folks who believe that, that, you know, all my life you told me, are you happy? Are you self-fulfilled? Well, yeah, that's what I want. So that must be the ultimate value system is me. Yeah. And, and we've switched now to the psychological man. So, so it's, this, it's this progression that we've seen. And it's interesting once you unplug God from it and, and go into individualism, then the next logical step would be not individualistic, economics, but individualistic feelings. Yeah. Um, there's another interesting aspect to it. Um, I, I know uh, Paul Truman kind of touches on that, the whole idea of human dignity. Mm-hmm. Ah. So along these four uh, shifts that we have seen, uh, the, the political man, the religious man, economic man, and psychological man, we find that it's interesting in all these times, I mean, dignity has been defined based on this, like polycentric dignity, mm-hmm. you know, dignity, uh, re- the religiocentric dignity. The polycentric dignity was more like you have to belo- belong to a, a, a political sphere. Right. If you belong there, you have certain dignity. If you held to a certain religious you know, uh, hierarchy, you had certain dignity based on that. And then the economic man, based on your trade, right. you were dignified based on that. But with the psychological man, it's interesting that with all the other three, you had to appeal to something ex- extrinsic. External, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely. To be dignified. Whereas with the psychological man, you're demanding dignity based on how you personally feel about. Yeah, you're demanding how much other people you reflect deserve. that yeah. back to you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's again, that's that's never before in human history have we seen this. Yeah. This is just completely. Uh, and all this is different yeah. from what the Bible teaches. Yeah. The scripture teaches us that every individual has intrinsic worth, all because we are made in the image of right. God. Right. right. It's as simple as that, actually. There's no, it's not even complicated. And but, dignity yeah. in all these four, you know, realms that we find, dignity can be perceived as being annihilated. But in yeah. a biblical perspective, dignity can be uh, uh, degraded or, de- you know, you can deprave someone of dignity. But it can never be unhighlighted, right? Right, it's it's, because it's intrinsic. It's it's yeah, built in. First of all, uh, Lenny, thanks for that uh, wonderful bridge from the different stages. Good, good job on that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and so now some of the points or some of the main ideas that Carl Truman 
uh, brings up is the whole idea of identity, right? And uh, Jacob, you are already uh, touching on that a little bit. As it relates to uh, the sexual, today's sexual revolution, like so for instance, if identity is uh, is very, uh, what he calls it expressive individualism, is connected very much into uh, who you think you are and not what uh, you really are, then um, then you have this tension between wanting to be autonomous and yet your need to belong to a group. Why don't you explain that? Uh, uh, I, I think he, he brings up Hegelian ideas of um, you know the whole slave master idea where you find your identity uh, within yourself or you think you do, but you really it doesn't find its full expression until another recognizes you. Right. Yeah. I think we have to understand that relationality, I call it relationality is an obligating feature of personhood. What do I mean by that is that we can't be persons by navel, navel gazing. You know, mm-hmm. we have to relate with the other. God created Adam from a biblical perspective. If you look at it, God created Adam as a person, but we see his personhood gets actualized in relationship with Eve right? His identity is recognized. I think that is very much intrinsic within us to actually long for that recognition from the other. And that happens only in the collective existence that we have. Um, uh, In regards to identity, we also need to recognize that there are different factors around it. For example, the idea of language, right? It plays a major role in terms of how we understand each other. And language exists only within a collective. It doesn't exist on it, right, on our so, own. Yeah, and we don't right. interpret things on the basis of just the way we want to. So I think uh, in identity creation, that's why it's so important these days. It's an important question. See, uh, and you talked about that, Lenny, how it is even informing our kids in the school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We are now taking up a project of identity creation. We are telling them what their identity is yeah. or making them to actually search and find their own identity, whatever they want it to be, mm-hmm. right? There is no way of uh, conforming within the collective as to what is recognized as true, good, and beautiful when it comes right. to identity. Right. You know, you make a, a, a good point, and I've said this as, as well, when we talk about language, language is something that's shared it, by definition, because you have to have a receiver, a recipient, as well as a, a communicator, and it can't therefore be personal. So when somebody says my pronouns, my first response is, what do you mean yours? Mm-hmm. What makes them yours? Pronouns by definition are language, and that means that we all have a common point of reference for them. They can't be yours. You can't just change things. It'd be like me saying, I'm going to decide that the word door now should be wall, or that I'm going to decide that a red light means go and green light means stop. You know, you get the same kind of yeah, yeah. Well, Charles Taylor is helpful on this. Remember, yeah. he talks about the the distinction between mimesis and poesis. Yes. And so now we've come to a um, uh, part in our culture where instead of discovering the world as it is, we are actually creating the mm. world, and and that's seeking uh, to. Yeah. Uh, and in that is exactly what happens. What we read in Romans eight, we end up either worshiping the creator or the creature. Mm-hmm right? Either we worship ourselves or the creature or, or, or you know, God himself, who is the lawgiver, who yeah. is the one who uh, basically bestows on us uh, a dignity based on the fact that we are made in his image. What are some ways that we can uh, uh, fix the current situation we're in? Uh, how do we point people to uh, accept their identity for who they really are and not something they fabricate on the fly. Well, there's the easy way and there's the hard way. Yeah. (laughs) The easy way is to throw everybody into a crisis point Mm -hmm. because all of a sudden, when it comes down to, can we all eat? All of that other stuff starts getting lost out the window and everybody has to band together and have a common goal outside of themselves in order to serve their needs. It's when a society becomes so affluent that it doesn't need to 
worry about its survival, it, it turns to these things. And I, I had mentioned before that I think that one of the problems is extreme affluence breeds hedonism. Mm -hmm. It seems to do so over and over again in history. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that it's easy, but it, it easy in the sense of uh, it makes the point for you, but it's just hard to live through. The harder way is to do it and still keep some of the affluent aspects of modern culture. The main thing that I would say is what kids are looking for today. We see it in the, in the suicide rates and the depression rates is they're looking for an understanding of value. That's more, weighty than what they've heard. And so I think we can start talking about things like what's actually beautiful, or do you want to know what real value is, what gives you value even beyond yourself, what makes you deeper than, and those I think are, are ideas that would start to resonate with people who are looking for those kinds of things, because most people are wanting to, I mean, some people say they have you know, I find my value in myself and say, how would you like to find value in something even deeper than you? Right. You know, if value is only good if somebody else, as you say, values it. Mm -hmm. And and there, there's an intrinsic worth that goes beyond right. what you think. And ultimately yourself. that someone is God, actually. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, what right. I would add to that is that we need to recognize that we as individuals, uh, what I call it is like uh, two-way catechism, you know, we we catechize the culture and are catechized by the culture. Mm. We can't deny that fact at all. So as, as those who trust in the Lord and we've been given the mandate to influence the world, be the salt of the, uh, the earth and light of the world, we have a task to understand that our identity is informed by the ecology within which we live. Yeah. And we have a responsibility to, to have an impact on it. And I think every faithful believer in Christ has a responsibility to raise up their child, the, their children, raise up their community in a way uh, that um, puts light on their true identity, right? Uh, and not hides it. So I think there's a responsibility for us. That's why I would say cultural apologetics is so much necessary yeah. and important. This is why what we are doing here is so important yeah. for us to be speaking about uh, ideas and thoughts that are, that are informing our culture. And we have a responsibility to actually uh, allow for that which is good at the same time, uh, uh, warn people of that, the, the bad that can happen through ideas that can be detrimental. Uh, to, uh, you know, at the end, worship the Lord. Right. We are called to w call our culture to worship the Lord. So, I, you know, I think any belief system needs to have two aspects to it. It needs to be internally coherent. It can't contradict itself. And it needs to be externally consistent. It needs to be consistent yeah. with the way we understand the world. And one of the problems with our modern culture is it is internally incoherent. Because if you ask most people, do you think selfishness by its nature is a good thing. Do you like other people when they're selfish? And that will tell you no, right? Mm. That's, that's mm. one of the biggest yeah. sins that a lot of people will point to is selfishness. But isn't the idea that I demand dignity from you people, you need to support my demands for dignity, isn't that by its nature selfishness? Mm -hmm. So can't we then stoke that and kind of press on that point and say, there's a way to do so without being selfish without, you know, and selflessness. Really, that's truly, when people talk about love, we're talking about selflessness. And so we can, we can press that tension point because there's no resolution for it in modern society's view right now. Hmm. Right. And I know our culture, they try to stay away from authority and institutions, but really what they need is to go to church. Yeah. And, uh, with the help of loving believers to help them discover their identity, their person that they were created to be. Mm -hmm. And they can only really find that in God, the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, step one in any uh, substance abuse program, you have to believe there's something higher than you. Mm. That's the very first step in any uh, substance abuse treatment program. Yeah. Wow. You were going to say something. Maybe we'll end with this, uh, Jacob. Um, if you guys are reading, uh, and there's a part where the author talks about a move from honor to human dignity, did you want to just clarify that a little bit? Because that was a little bit confusing with Carl Truman. 
Yeah, uh, I think uh, after reading the first chapter, I felt like there was a kind of like um, a presumed conflict between honor and dignity. I think there are two different categories there. Um, and what Carl Truman uh, compares is honor and equal dignity. So I don't, I don't think he might be doing this, but uh, what he's trying to do is actually compare between graded idea of dignity, that dignity can be graded among individuals and they can be equal dignity. Um, from a biblical perspective, as I said earlier, we hold to this belief that we all are made in the image of God. So we do have equal dignity, right? A dignity that cannot be annihilated. Uh, 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 but in terms of honor, I think what he's trying to do is that to explain that there's a kind of dignity that is uh, acquired through certain kind of possessions, be it uh, if you belong to a certain caste, if you if you have certain kind of like, uh, you know, uh, a business or you have title or something. Uh, so th that's what I, I thought he is doing. I hope he is mm -hmm. doing yeah. uh, that he is not arguing ag against equal dignity as right. being a product of psychological man. Right, right, right. Well, you've been listening to apologetics.com where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. Our hope is that you've learned some aspect about the Christian worldview that strengthens your faith and make you want to learn more. So special thanks to my regular panelists, Jacob and Lenny, and to our valiant uh, engineer back there, Mix, to make he makes sure that we sound good here. So um, special thank you to our listeners as well. Until next time, good night.